Hello everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to the academy class, Afflictions of Christians. Last time as we shared the words about Christian afflictions, when we go through afflictions, the Spirit of God is together with us. And also through afflictions, we begin to earnestly desire the heart of God. And also we shared the words about how through those afflictions we draw closer to God. Uh, this time I would like to speak about the benefits that comes from the afflictions of Christ. First, we will read from the book of Psalms 119, starting from verse 65. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Thou art good, and doest good, teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. We read up to verse 72. Everyone, when we mention afflictions, we don't really want to hear about it. It can be something that we feel burdened about, that we want to avoid. But actually, the fruits that affliction brings, and if we get to know the benefits that we gain from it, then these afflictions are something that we should clash against in order to gain something we will begin to have the heart to know that these are not things that we should avoid. Uh, there is uh, Catholicism and also Protestantism that we refer to. They're sometimes referred to as the Protestants. And so in English, it is referred to as Protestant. It has the meaning of one who goes against or as one who protests. Why is it that when they are Christians, this label is placed on them? In the first churches, uh, the Christians, uh, they spoke just like Christ. And because they acted just like Christ, that was the label given to them. And so that sounds nice to hear. But then why were the Christians uh, divided between the Protestants and Catholics? And the reason they were labeled as Protestants, as Martin Luther uh, began the religious reformation, and so with 95 theses against the, the Catholic Church, against Catholicism, with the 95 theses, he pushed for reform. Martin Luther was a man who really sought after God. He wanted to find any way to gain God and to receive salvation, and that he gave penance, and that on his knees, as he climbed up the stairs that Jesus walked on with his knees, to the point that his knees were a bloody mess, this is a man who lowered himself and acted diligently. But it was still not resolved in his heart, that problem of sin. And also during those times, you could not acquire a Bible. Uh, they were in a situation where, did that, where they did not know exactly what the Word of God said. But one day, through a friend, uh, as he was able to acquire a Bible, he began to read the Word. As he was reading the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 17, he came to the Word where it says, The just shall live by faith. And then he was shocked by it. Until now, he tried to make his, make his works good and to do good deeds and to not sin. And as he practiced penance in his life, this is how he tried to wash away sin. But now, from a completely different direction, 
it says that the just shall live by faith, or that the just receive salvation by faith. And so now as he realized this truth, his eyes were opened. It means that he accepted that very precise life of Jesus Christ. From the moment that that word entered him, the world that he has been looking to was now all a lie. And so all the words spoken by the priest, the diocese, and even the Pope were words that were so contrary to the Bible. And also, in order to wash away sin, as he saw that the sale of indulgences to receive forgiveness of sin, as he saw all these things that were nonsense, he could not continue the way he was. And so within his heart, the life that Luther received, because it couldn't just settle in his heart, he rose up and now he began to clash. Or he went against them. A living fish does not just flow down with the flowing water, but because it has life, it's able to go against the current. As a result, Christians who have this power of life, it is very contrary to the worldly things. And Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the system that he has installed in this world, and the life, the power of life that Jesus possesses, and they are opposites, and so they have no choice but to clash. And as a result, Martin Luther began the religious reformation, and afterwards the label that was given was the name Protestant, which means that there is life. And so if you have life and you clash against it, then naturally afflictions will follow. Everyone, that affliction is truly an affliction that is valuable. And so, therefore, as Christians, as we go through afflictions, uh, the power of life from God is formed within it. And when we think about it now, how great of a blessing is it? We had the 500th anniversary of the Reformation three years ago in the year 2017. If at that time we did not fight that fight, then we would have to think that there would be no fruits who heard the gospel today. And that's why the, uh, after the affliction, the fruits of God that come about, they are revealed as uh, tremendous fruits. And that's why Christians, through affliction, there are so many things that God wants to manifest. The power of Christ is revealed to those who are afflicted. And as we collide, it is revealed. But people today, they think, oh, good things are good. Uh, they just let things pass because they make compromises. But if you precisely receive the guidance of God's Word and of the Holy Spirit to not clash, that is what is abnormal. Clashing is normal, and receiving afflictions is what is normal. But afterward, the fruits that are produced are very precise. Uh, therefore, for example, a person like Mordecai, he could have bowed once to Haman. You know, how difficult would that be for him? But he refused. He went against him. And because he thought that to kill one man Mordecai would be too light of a punishment, and now an order was given to destroy all of the Jews to whom Mordecai belonged to. And now because the king also stamped it with, with his ring, and so surely it will be carried out. And so then he pushes Esther forward, and to Esther, who does have life, but yet she had settled, he tells her to go forward. And we can see that she goes before King Ahasuerus. 
and through it, it seems like that they would be killed, that they would be ruined. But through this incident, the power of life that is inside of Esther, it explodes outwardly. There is the work of changing King Ahasuerus' heart, and also Haman is removed. And also Mordecai is exalted to the seat of governor. And of course, the people of Israel, the Jews, as they enter into the month of Purim, uh, they are restored. And uh, the people who try to harm them, uh, they are actually ruined by the hands of the Jews. This is why the power of life that Christians possess, it cannot just settle. It is also the same for religion that has corrupted. And also regarding the flow of the world, we are people who go against it. And because if you don't go against it, it means that you have already been corrupted. Just as it is stated in Hebrews chapter 2, you become a person who just flows away. And so as God permits unto us various afflictions, so that through these afflictions, God wants to reveal the great abundance of the power of life. And also when we are afflicted, to show us that Christ has the power to overcome afflictions, through these afflictions, it, this is what is proved. So as God gives us afflictions, the glory that comes afterwards, the goodness that comes afterwards, this is what He is teaching us. And that's why people at times think incorrectly about afflictions. When we see someone who, who is facing difficulties, we think, oh, there is something wrong with that person. That's God's punishment, curse. It's His penalty. In this direction, people interpret it. But actually, that's not true. God, in order to help us grow, these are just the processes that we need to go through but people, according to their own logical standards of good and evil, this is the way they interpret things. When the Israelites went down to Egypt, they went boldly by the special command of the governor. They were very well treated, and they were placed in the land of Goshen, and all of their treatment was good. But after Joseph died, and all the kings that knew Joseph after they died, uh, the Israelites slowly became slaves. Later, they were baking bricks. They began to live their lives as slaves, receiving such afflictions. And so, why did God give them such afflictions? We wear this flesh. And because they too were looking toward the world, Egypt is the world. They had a certain heart for the world. But already through Jacob, they have been given a promise about the land of Canaan. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. God said that you shall return here. Then the Israelites should have remembered that promise. And that is the way they should have been living in Egypt. But they had no conception of such a promise. And that was the reason why God had to permit afflictions upon them. So that in their hearts they may realize, oh, we really do not want to live here anymore. We want to go back. They cried out to God to the point that it said that their cries reached out to God. In their hearts, now they had a heart yearning for the land of Canaan as the heart to remember the promise was formed inside of them. Later, Moses goes to them and leads them out. But even after being led out, when they faced the smallest of problems, a heart wanting to return back to Egypt still remained in them. And so the reason why afflictions are given to us is that through it, the promise given to us by God becomes much clearer as it becomes more precise. And now the direction that we must go in is not to flow down together with the flesh, 
But as we resist the flesh, to go against the flesh, and in order to develop a deep relationship with God, this is a certain method that the Lord uses. And that is why when we regard the Word, we see that we incorrectly think about afflictions. But ultimately, regarding the width of our spiritual life, the depth, the height, and the length, He is trying to increase them. When we look in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, it says, May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. It's saying, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Even David, when he prayed to God, he prayed God in Psalm 61, verse 2. He says, From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He is asking God to lift him up higher. He's not asking for a higher position. What he is saying is that he does not want to live according to his standards or his senses, but according to the senses of God. He's asking God to guide him, to lift him up so that he may see from the heights of God. He's asking him to guide him to a rock that is higher than him. We need depth. Even the oceans, when you look at the depth of the Pacific Ocean, and when you look at the depth of the Atlantic Ocean, they have different depths. Also, in regarding spiritual life, we all have different depths of our hearts. The deeper it goes, the more firm it feels. We don't need to waver and we could tolerate. And so in order to create this world for us, so through afflictions, God permits them unto us. God wants to lead us to the fullness of Christ. And what is it that we need? It is that through afflictions and tribulations, this is how God grows our hearts. Uh, and another topic, after receiving salvation, there are many things that we know. We listen to many things about this and that. And as we listen, uh, we are sometimes mistaken to think that what we know is our spiritual life. But what God says is that, no, that's what you just know, but it has not been converted into faith in your heart. Some people, they give a testimony, the gospel that I knew in my head, in order to be fulfilled in my heart, it took many tens of years. It means there's a difference between what you know and what you believe. Uh, which is why when we look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so here it says, to unite faith and what we know, God gives us afflictions. That even by giving certain circumstances, these two things that even though you don't believe, you're mistaken to think that you believe, uh, because what you know cannot be power to you. Only when faith comes to you, that converts into power. That becomes strength. As I do work for the mission, as more time passes by in my heart, I ask, who works in this world? In the beginning, after receiving salvation, when I was working, there were so many things where I was working. But one day, just as one of the hymns, when I carry that heavy burden alone and cannot help but to collapse, our Lord Jesus, who showed compassion to come and save me, and that hymn really came and touched my heart. 
I thought, oh, this is affliction, but why was affliction given to me? Because I thought that the work in front of me was my work to do. The power of life of Christ in my heart, it was so great. But while I relied upon myself to live my life, what God was trying to do was try to peel that away. Only when the flask is shattered, you can smell the fragrance of the oil within. So this is not the world where the flask is working. He had to change it to a world where that fragrant oil is working. And in order to do that, what was necessary was affliction. And so when you go through numerous afflictions, you realize, oh, it cannot be done through me. Uh, this mission, for me to preach the gospel, how can a person like me, through the strength of the flask, was I trying to do this work? You know, it would make no sense. And so when this was peeled away, I became so thankful. Ah, the Lord is going to work. This mission work is not something that I can do. To change that person, I can't change that person. It's not about me. So as these things crumble down, because I began to have hope in God who was going to work for me, everyone, even though it was the same work, I did not consider it as work anymore. That's why the Lord says, You who are weary and heavy laden, come to me, and I will give you rest. And so in the past, I just knew that. But what I'm saying is that those words were not just spoken without any meaning. It's saying that if you work, you will be wearied and it will become a heavy load. But pass it on to me. I will do it for you and you can rest. And so in order to adjust this relationship, what do you think is necessary? At times, God has to give us a heavy load. And truly in front of the circumstance called China, everyone, no matter how much I think about it, how could I fight against this great power and win? How can I fight against the circumstances here and win? Of course, I can't do it. But Jesus Christ can do that work. And so then as my heart passed over onto the Lord, I was able to rest, I was able to praise God, and I was able to gather the fruits of God's work. And that's why with what we know and what we believe, and also when we look in the book of Job, when we look in Job 42 verse 5, even Job says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. And so this is what we often say, Oh, I heard it from someone. In passing, I heard this is what they said. Oh, someone said, you know, someone said this. And this is how we often live. And even Job, he said, I have heard of the Lord. But now it is not just about hearing. I have seen him with my own eye. He's saying, now I am able to see God. And this was the reason why Job had to receive his affliction. And so with us, God, He wants to become one with us. He wants us to become one with God. In order to make us become one with the Word, it was something that is very necessary. And so regarding afflictions, people, they may sometimes say, what, does that mean that afflictions are enjoyable? Is it pleasing to the flesh? No, it is not. It is not enjoyable, but it is good. So when we think about the goodness of it, whether it's enjoyable or not enjoyable, those terms are only within the world of emotions. Because in just a few moments, all those things will pass, and the fruit that will be produced is the fruit of goodness. Because the fruits of God's glory will be produced upon us. And so when we think about that goodness, then we can do anything. That's why Martin Luther said that if I didn't have affliction, I would not have understood the Bible. So within afflictions, the depth of how we read the Bible differs, and the angle widens and it becomes deeper and higher and longer. Once I read a proverb, when you remove the stones from the stream, the stream will no longer sing for you. As the stream water flows, the sound of the water clashing against the stones, it's beautiful, it is the nature's singing. 
But if you remove the stones and say, oh, let the water flow smoothly, there will be no more singing. And that's why in our lives, God, he permits us various difficulties so that God may give us his things and for us to gain them. If there is no air resistance, we think that planes will fly well. But just as without any air resistance, a plane cannot fly, it's actually the air resistance that allows us to fly and takes us higher. Which is why normal spiritual life is a spiritual life receiving afflictions together with the gospel. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And so people who live normal spiritual lives, there are people who are afflicted together with the gospel. Also in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, it says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. It means that they rejoiced in suffering the affliction. And they were rejoicing of the fact that they were counted worthy of affliction. It's because afflictions are not just given to anyone. Not anyone is just punished. But these afflictions are given because we are the children of God. Uh, that's why for us to receive afflictions, it's actually because we are counted worthy. When we read Galatians chapter 4, verse 1, there it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. It mentions the two qualifications as Christians. The first is that we are heirs that we are the inheritor, we are the descendant. This is how we are described. And then it says that we are the Lord of all. In Luke chapter 15, verse 32, the firstborn son speaks about the prodigal son. He complains against the prodigal son. And he says, I have never went against the commandment of my father, but you never gave me a kid of the goats. But when this younger brother has returned, this younger brother who wasted all of his inheritance with harlots when he returned, the father killed the fatted calf. And when he complained, the father says, all that I have is yours. That's how the father describes it. And so when we look in this verse, it's the same, that he is the Lord of all and that you are the inheritor. Simply saying, it means that you are his son. We have that special right of being an inheritor. For example, let's say that we have a certain company and it establishes the first, the second, and the third in line. And let's say that there's an employee who takes the entrance exam and he becomes the supervisor and manager. And also, as a child, as he study and goes abroad to study, uh, there is a son who enters into the company in order to gain you know, business experience. And even though they may be in the same position as manager, in your eyes, are they both the same? Of course not. We don't even need to talk about that. They are different. But what is the difference? It's the difference of responsibility. Let's say that for an employee who took, took an exam and became a manager, of course he would have an interest for the company. And also in order for him to survive, for the company to do well, that is a heart that an employee should have. But just because of that, you know, after getting off work, does he continually, doesn't keep the heart to think, you know, how can we make the company do better and thinking about the company's future? He doesn't have that kind of heart. He has a limited liability. But if you are the son, you wonder what is the economy of the world like now? Or in the future, how is this business going to develop or should we reduce or expand the way a son would think about it would be very different because he has unlimited liability 
And so let's say that a son stood up all night working. For him, it would not be something to really boast about, but rather it's something matter of course. For all the things that are going to happen in the future to this company, whether glorious or whether becoming successful or becoming rich, all these things, who do they belong to? It belongs to him. And just because he stayed up all night working a little bit, it's really not something for him to boast about. Because he has unlimited liability, because he's the Lord of all. And as an inheritor of the business, as a matter of course, he should be joined together in its difficulty and must be able to work all throughout the night. And when the company faces danger, he may even sell all that he has to invest into the company to save it. We cannot even call that a sacrifice or an affliction. Why? Because all these things are his. Because that is his whole life. Because that is the totality of his life, he has to live that way. The same thing with the Christians. God says to us, you are no longer slaves. Forsake the spirit of a slave. When a slave encounters difficulties, they complain, they resent. But the son doesn't do that. The owner does not do that. The owner wants to resolve that problem and jumps into the problem and absorbs it and tries to change everything to gain something out of it. And that's why afflictions are something that we should be joined together as a matter of course. It's not something that can be avoided, but rather we should jump into it and fight against it and clash against it to gain the power of life and proceed in the direction of gaining the inheritance of Jesus. That's why Noah's son, with unlimited liability, they built the ark for 110 years. It was truly a glorious task. But for 110 years, for them to do that work for over 100 years, even though it was tremendous afflictions, but what were they thinking? They believed in the glory that they would gain at the end because they lived thinking about that. Therefore, that affliction was not something that anyone could experience. And that's why the afflictions given to us are afflictions together with Jesus Christ. That's why in the book of Romans, uh, book of Romans chapter 8, verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. It's saying that if you are a child, then you are an heir. And it says that you are an heir of God, but also joint heirs with Christ. That in order to be glorified together, we also are afflicted together. David, through the words in the book of Psalm 119, David, he says, rather he sings, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, through the afflictions, he says, Now I have kept thy word. He's saying, Now no longer will I trust in my senses. He's not going to believe in his feelings or experiences. Now he said that he is going to keep the word of God, which means that the word is going to preserve David's life. That's why through affliction, there were many things that he learned. He says he has learned the statutes of God. He learned the principles of the word. No matter what problem may arise, no matter what circumstance he may face, David learned that everything was going to be done according to the word. But previously, even though the word said so, but if in my eyes, if it seemed good, he went down that path. He says that he went astray. So it's through affliction he was able to put to an end the fleshly lusts, ambitions, and covetousness. And just like pure gold, everything is done according to the word. All of my judgments, they ended in ruin. David learned that only the judgment of the word will perfectly keep his life.
And that's why in verse 71, it says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Also in verse 70, it says, Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. Their hearts have grown fat, fat as grease, being only full of the flesh of the humanistic things, the emotional things. And they are completely filled with the fleshly things. But David, now all of that fat has been stripped away from him. Through affliction, he learned that all of the fleshly judgments were wrong. He acknowledged them. Therefore, what was it that David learned? He said that through afflictions, he learned the statutes of God. When you learn of his statutes, everyone, at a very decisive moment, everything will continue according to the statutes. Everyone with us, it is not that problems rise up every day. And it seems like it's not that every day we have that need to follow the word. Under ordinary times, everything passes by well. Also in the book of Jeremiah chapter 12, it says, You may be safe in the land of peace, but what will you do when the river Jordan swells upon you? And so the reason why we must learn the statutes, you know, when everything is peaceful, when there are no problems, we can pass over them. But at a decisive moment when the river waters of the river Jordan overflows, at that time, if you do not learn of faith, if you have not learned about the statutes of God, what are you going to do? And so it is challenging you. It is not that in our lives we always have a problem. But at a single decisive moment when we do not know the statutes of God's word, sometimes our whole lives can crumble down. In Hong Kong, there is a freshwater lake that provides water for plumbing. There are several reservoirs, and the water quality is pretty good, uh, to the point that you could drink out of the faucet. Uh, there's a place where they blocked off uh, sea water and they're saving the water there. Uh, one day, there was something that happened that I didn't understand. So in Hong Kong, there are many freshwater lakes, there are reservoirs where they have, where they saved clean water, and that is more than enough. But still on the mainland, uh, near the Donggang River, uh, they would purchase water from that river, and they would save it in the freshwater lakes and reservoirs, and then they would again release it into the ocean. And so I asked, why did they do that? Isn't the water that they have more than enough? And what they said was, yes, it is you know, more than enough. But when they calculated in a what 10-year span, once every 10 years, uh, they run out of water. You know, when they calculated you know, from the beginning. And so every 10 years, when they do run out of water, you know, when there is not enough water, what are you going to do then? And so for the sake of that just one time, during those 10 years, they use money to buy water and then to toss it out, to buy it again, to toss it out. But one time, it will be used when they really need it. For the sake of that one time, they invest for 10 years. And when I heard that, I was shocked. Everyone, if we think about our spiritual lives, in our lives, we face that decisive moment. You know, that moment when we really need faith. Surely there will be a time when we need to rely upon the Word of God to prevail over things. At that time, if we have not learned about the Word of God or the statutes of God, if we have not learned about the principles of God, then life would have no choice but to truly suffer. When I looked at the life of David, I was able to understand why David was able to sing this song. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. He is saying that through these afflictions, I learned the statutes of God. Everyone, David, he's a Christian.
He is a person who possesses life. But there was a point where he flowed away. When was that? When he was chased by Saul, one day a certain thought entered him. I won't be able to live a full life like this. I too, as I was sent on a mission, I was always chased. I thought my heart would not be able to take it. And there were so many things that would just shock me. And there was also so much shocking news. And so, of course, these thoughts could enter. Same thing with David, a certain thought came into his heart and then he went over to the side of the Philistines. He ran away. But even there, the Philistine king gave him a city called Ziklag and allowed him to live there. And the servants under him opposed the idea that David was with them. Especially when the Philistines went out to fight against Israel, and when David wanted to join them in battle, they were actively against it. And as a result, he could not go out to war, so he was going back to his children, to his wife, and to where his possessions were when he came back to Ziklag. Uh, something terrible had happened. Ziklag had been pillaged by the Amalekites. It had turned into ash because it was all burned in the fire. They wept until they had no power to weep anymore. Especially those people under him. There were people who had nowhere else to go, people who were in debt, people who were in distress, or people in grief. People like these, they had followed David. And David, he protected them, he trained them. But when the problems actually came to them, these people, they said that they didn't need David. Rather, they were saying, because of you, we are ruined. We lost our wives, we lost our children, we lost our possessions, we have nothing. They picked up stones, willing to stone David. David also wept until he had no more strength to weep, and he was in great suffering as well. Everyone, when you are in this situation, what would you do? What do you think you will do? I think, you know, I too, I too would just rather die. You know, you die and I die, and if they just flow together according to their emotions, you know, it'll turn out this way, wouldn't they all be bitter? You know, up until now, they were protected, they enjoyed it, they followed well. But now, because it was no longer profitable to them, seeing how these people wanted to kill David, we wonder how David was able to overcome this affliction. How did he overcome? He did not believe in the judgment of his flesh. He did not believe in his own heart. Why? It is because he learned the statutes. Always when he thought that everything was going to come to an end, it was not the end. The senses of his flesh were telling him, now this is the end. This is where your life will end. Even though you were anointed, but one day you will die at the hands of Saul. So he had this kind of judgment, but it didn't turn out that way. Through afflictions, every time God protected him, and he was once hiding in a cave, how is it that Saul ended up sleeping at the entrance of the cave? God allowed him to fall asleep. One by one, he learned how God was protecting him through affliction. That's why when he judged for himself, there was nothing to depend on, there was nothing for him to wait on. And that would be David's conclusion. The conclusion that came from David's flesh was like this. But in that moment of desperation and despair, now at a moment where his body and his years would have come to an end, and in that situation, we have to see where the heart of David goes over onto. He goes to God to ask of him. And so what does this mean? So in my view, no matter how accurate I think it is, but that is still not right. 
That is not something to trust in. That is just only my judgment. It's just my senses, my experience, my feelings. But when we go before God, it is different. That's what He had. He learned something that was so precious. He learned the statutes of God and He asked of God. He said to bring the ephod, to put on the clothing that the priest would wear. He goes in front of God and asks, God, if I pursue after them, will I overtake them? What do you think God said? It's too late. That's not what He said. Instead, God says, Thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. And so David, following after that statute of God, and so he pursues them. And he doesn't do it by force. Those who are tired and without strength, he allows them to rest. And that Egyptian young man that was forsaken, even though he's so busy, he heals him. Why? Because the Word of God said that he will recover all. That's why he doesn't hurry. It seems like the Egyptian young man is not needed, but yet he saves him. But this young man is the one who guides them to the Amalekites. And what is it that David really learned? Did he make money? Did he prop up his background? Or did he make some personal connections? He did not do anything like that. But if there is something that he did learn, he says that I have learned his statutes. I too uh, was dispatched in 1994 and I went to China. Uh, in my heart, I was truly thankful and it really uplifted my heart. But only within five months, I was arrested. I had just started preaching the gospel and we had about three different services, three different gatherings. And brothers and sisters would come visit at my home and I would go visit them. And as I would go on witnessing trips, also learning Chinese, it was a time of great hope. But within five months, I was captured, I was arrested, I was punished, and then I was deported. And I was really resentful toward God. God, it's not that I was doing something else, but I was preaching the gospel, but you couldn't protect me from doing that? Were you not able to protect me from doing that? That's the kind of heart that I had. At times I cried. I was so bitter and I was so disappointed because I thought that, that I could never return. You know, it was something really hard for me to digest. But everyone, do you know what happened afterwards? Less than one month later, I was able to return. At that time, the pastor who was my teacher he said, this time, I am going to go with you. And so I was really surprised. You know, I had just become deported and everything seemed so down. But Pastor Park said, I will go with you. And so I did not know how to prepare for it, but in the end, we really went together. And that is how we had the first week of the retreat. 183 people attended. Uh, so many people were really led by the Word. It was at that time that the foundation of the Gospel was really well established. It was a moment where the foundation of our mission was established. One month prior, I had fallen into despair. I had a heart to think that I would never be able to return. But less than one month later, I realized that the senses that I had were all fake. And again, about a year and a half later, I was again arrested. And that time, the shock to me was not as great. And so I was deported, but with faith, knowing that God, He was going to comfort me. And again, about two months later, I returned. 
At that time, the works of the gospel that I could not ever imagine arose. In the northern regions, our witnessing team went there and preached the gospel. And as many leaders there heard the gospel and accepted the gospel, many assemblies were created. And there was the work of God where those people joined us. And we received the grace of being able to have the retreat throughout the whole country at the same time. When I was deported the second time, many people, they were sad and crying. And then for a long time, I lived well. Well, more so than living well, it's because God protected me. And for over 10 years, I was uh, able to preach the gospel and live well there. But then again, for the third time, I was deported. And so I was arrested again and then deported again. At that time, what kind of heart do you think I had? Now I too had learned many of his statutes. Ah, this thing, this is something I should be happy about. Apart from any of the circumstances, the things that God has given to me, the things that God gives to those who love Him, to those who are called according to His will, work together to form what is good. And so this statute was being established in my heart. And so I said, let no one be sad. Also in my heart, I said, let us have a feast. Let us have a feast. For our growth, when Isaac was weaned, Abraham, he held a feast for him. And according to our growth, because this is the reason why God is working, we can all rejoice together. And so truly all the brothers and sisters, as they accepted this heart, and so we were actually able to leave very joyfully. And then afterwards, God, He opened the era of Hong Kong. And we had that very famous seminar where, you know, salvation is very difficult. We had that era of the CLF. And as ministers joined us, not of denomination or doctrine, but with the slogan of, let us return to the Bible, we were able to gather together. And at that time, over 1,150 ministers, if you believe, it's easy. Salvation is hard. This is what they said. But if you believe it, it's easy. With that single word, the gospel was planted in their hearts, and they received that grace of becoming one with God. Now, since then, a lot of time has passed. 27 years have passed. And again, God is opening up new paths before us. And so now, my heart does not waver between, oh, it's like this or like that, or it's this way or that way. God, for the sake of the gospel and to expand our tent, God is just opening up new ways for us. But these things cannot become an affliction to us at the end. It is just the process of going through the works of God. And so the judgment that I feel, if we live with them always, then we can only go astray and waver, and we can become nervous. But however, the statutes of God that He gives us, through afflictions, we can precisely learn what God wants. That's why God says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. With this one statute, whatever we encounter, we can say, Oh, that's not true. It is not a problem. It'll be all right. In the eyes of God, this is something good. Everyone being arrested, thrown into jail. With these things, we think, Oh, why this again? But when we go before the servants of God who have learned these statutes, they say, it's okay, this is something good. It was not easy to understand. It's a point that is hard to follow. But the servants have learned the statutes. Because things are done according to the statutes, 
you know, to be led by a certain circumstance or emotion, you know, they don't go back and forth, but rather they're steadfast. They say, it's okay, and see how God will work. Now this is the world that is formed. David, he boasts that he has learned of this statute. He praises that statute. And so it is this statute that turned David, who was a shepherd tending to the flock, into the king of Israel, the shepherd of Israel. And so at that decisive moment, David, who had learned this one thing, he became king. But Saul, he did not learn of the statute. He just wanted the circumstances to pass. He just wanted the problems to disappear. Everyone, what's important to us is for us to learn the statute. But to change the circumstances, and that is not important at all. Because these are things that have to happen anyway. And so in this way, as God leads us, in our hearts, God wants to establish His world. And so He wants to establish His statutes and His principles. That's why David says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Just as it is engraved in David's heart, also in our hearts and in my heart, the words that God has given us in each time that we face difficulty, may they be alive in our hearts to the extent that they don't need to be in the Bible anymore, so that we may say, Ah, God is going to work. This is the work of God. For these things to remain and for them to become power in our lives, and just as it held on to me for Him to say that I kept Thy word, you know, the word became power to hold on to me. Everyone in your lives, there is something that you must learn. You have to learn the statute. And some people, even when they make an instinctive decision, at times I think it's so tragic. Oh, if that person has learned the statute, even though in that person's view there is a despair that he cannot recover from, but that is only his senses. That is only your judgment. If they're able to overcome that just one time, that suffering, that difficulty, that bitterness, that lowliness, He will be able to prevail over all of them. Could you not go forward to gain a new world? So therefore, what Christians must learn is the Lord's statute. And if you learn that, no matter what we encounter, we are more than able to overcome. Everyone, I'd like to thank you for joining us. And today, we will stop the word here. Thank you very much.